Let's try that again. Good afternoon. It's nice to have each of you with us. Elizabeth is not able to be with us. She came down with RSV this last week, and she is in our prayers. David talked to her, texted with her this afternoon. She's feeling a little bit better, so that's good. So let's keep Elizabeth in our prayers. On the back of your bulletin, you will see our announcements, Thanksgiving basket donations. If you haven't brought them in, we are trying to get everything in by noon tomorrow as we put together our baskets. There are still some things that are needed, so there are sign-up sheets out in the um, entryway. Please look them over. We'd love for you to um, let us know if there's stuff you could bring. Um, Cruise Giving is our event that we do with our youth, where the youth make a side dish, a main dish, or a dessert, and we do a judge for them, and it's a lot of fun. That is tomorrow afternoon. Families are invited to attend with the youth. Also, a night in Bethlehem, which is an interactive experience of going to the time when Jesus was born. We are hosting it or putting it together from our church on Sunday, December 10th. We still need some items donated for it, particularly, I guess, there's like cans and things that are listed on here. But also that afternoon, I believe it starts at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's a wonderful event, and we'd love to have you attend. Families attend together, and you go to different stations, and it's a really neat thing that we've done before, and we hope to have a good turnout. Also, White Christmas. These are tickets for the play White Christmas. They sell for $20 each, and we buy a block for our church. We have 14 tickets left. We buy them for Sunday, December 3rd, for the 3 p.m. performance. If you are interested in going, it's a wonderful, wonderful event. It's at Massasoit Community College, but it's a community theater, and the sign-up sheet is in the entryway. We have 14 tickets left, and we'd love, if any of you would like to get them, to please sign up. Now, join with me in our call to worship. Shout joyful praises to God all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Your enemies cringe before your mighty power. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious song. Let us stand. Glory be to the Father. I'm not quite Drake Irby. Hopefully he will be back next week, but I will try to lead you in our first hymn, number 83, Come Ye Thankful People Come. Let's join and sing together. Storms begin, God our Maker. 
seated. I invite you to join with me in our unison prayer. It is found in our bulletin. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and your blessings over us. Thank you for bringing hope, though even the toughest of times, strengthening in us for your purposes Thank you for your great love and care. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for always being with us and never leaving. Thank you for your incredible sacrifice so that we may have freedom and life. Forgive us for when we don't thank you enough for who you are, for all that you do, for all that you've given. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you afresh. Renew our spirits. Fill us with your peace and joy. We love you and we need you this day and every day. We give you praise and thanks for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. And we do take time in our service to lift up the prayer concerns of our church. My wife, Regina, has had an interesting week this week because her brother, had a heart procedure. He did very well out in Ohio. And then her sister-in-law, Jan, had triple bypass surgery. She also did well. So we pray for, nope, they were not married. That's their, they're also brother-in-law and sister-in-law. But it's been a major thing going on with them. So thankfully, they are both doing well. Other names of individuals we should lift up in prayer? Jack's sister is doing much better. Wonderful. Yep. Yes. So your mother-in-law's best friend passed away, and prayer specifically for your mother-in-law during that time. Absolutely. Yep. That's kind of what I was saying with Regina. It's hard because it's two very close people her brother, and her sister-in-law. So thank you. Other names? Kathy Matthews, who oversees a lot of things, including our church membership, and also she's in charge of our Thanksgiving donations. She has been very ill with a respiratory bug that hasn't cleared up, so prayers for her. She was able to talk to me a little bit this afternoon, which is good, but it's hard when you get hit with those things. So let us bow our heads and hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your goodness. We thank you this Thanksgiving week as we prepare to celebrate with our family, as we gather around the table and we set aside a time to be thankful, make that be who we always are. Help us to be grateful. Help us to be optimistic and positive, to know that you are God and you are in control. And at those times when things frustrate us, help us to trust in you. We pray for each of these persons we've lifted up, especially those who've had loved ones go through difficult times or the loss of a good friend. We just pray for your healing and your comfort. We pray for both Elizabeth and, and Kathy as they have both been ill with respiratory illnesses. Help both of them to get through this and to get healthy and to... Just have your healing touch. We thank you for a chance to be in worship. We thank you for this church and ministry we have to the community as we prepare to put out these gifts of baskets to families who struggle during this time and other times of the year. May the things that we do be an expression of love and your grace. We thank you for our encounter weekend. We had this last few days, this training that was done by the Free Methodist Church and the many people who came to it and just how meaningful that training was. We thank you for your faithfulness and helping our church to be a place to teach not only within our church but beyond our walls. And for all these, our prayers and many others, we lift them in the name of Jesus, remembering that our Savior taught us to pray by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you came prepared to make a contribution to Faith Community Church, we make our offerings really two different ways. One is by using one of the offering boxes or by going online to faithcommunityma.com. We thank you for your faithful giving, and we take a moment as we take time with our offertory. Father, we dedicate these, our gifts of tithes and offerings. We pray your blessing upon each gift and upon each giver. May all that we do be used by you in this hurting world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And please remain standing as we sing hymn number 85. Join together as we sing for the fruit of all creation.
move on with our message. I'd like to note that there are new Bibles in the pews, as we mentioned to you. These are the New Living Translation, which is the same translation that we use for the Sunday morning and Saturday evening or afternoon services. And therefore, we are going to take a moment and dedicate them, both at this service and also the Sunday service. We thank the Connors, Pete and Gail Connor, who graciously and generously donated these. We also have our memorial bricks that we have waited a long time for. People ask us when they're coming in. We raise the funds, and we have the names of the individuals that get honored in our memorial garden. And trust me, if it was easy to get them in sooner, we would have, since one of them is one of the bricks that our family is, is donated. But it does take time because we work with a big company that does a lot of different engraving, and they put us kind of in the queue. But they surprised us by getting them to us this last week. After each month, we would ask, when are they going to be in? And we just found out a couple days ago that they were in, so we're also going to take a prayer for that. If you still want to be part of our memorial garden, it is an ongoing garden. We will certainly be letting people know about that in the future, but this is the most recent group of bricks that are going to be going into the garden. So I'd just like to take a moment and pray both for our Bibles and for the bricks. But I'm going to ask you to please take one of the Bibles there in the pews, so wherever you're sitting, if you're a couple, grab one of them. They're all before you in the black ones, and just hold them as we have our prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these scriptures that help us understand your word and who you are. We pray for each of these Bibles, that they would be used by our congregation and families that come in, people who maybe for the first time are hearing your word, to understand it, to learn to apply it to their lives. We dedicate them for our worship, for our teaching, for our learning, and for your glory. And likewise, we see these bricks that represent loved ones that we have lost as family members and friends. We pray for our memorial garden and especially for these families that dedicate these bricks. We pray that as we come to our church and we see our garden, it would be a remembrance that our loved ones we may say goodbye to in this world. But through our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we know that we have that blessed hope of being reunited. We pray for the families that these bricks mean so much to. And we pray for our congregation that we would continue to honor those we love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of going to the grocery store, and of course, if you're not getting one or two things, but you're getting 87 or 88 things, you can't carry everything in your arms, you have to get a cart. So you walk over and you grab the cart, and of course, it's not exactly clean, but it is the cart that you're going to have, so you walk over and you look at all the smudges and any of the imperfections, and you say, well, this is now my cart. So you grab the cart and you pull it out. And everything seems fine for a few moments until you realize that suddenly you're pushing and this starts happening. Uh, uh, you got a wobbly wheel. Have you ever had a wobbly wheel in your grocery cart? Now, it's helpful because sometimes a wobbly wheel, when we're in our grocery cart, what do we think is going to fix it? More weight, right? The more I load my cart, the better my cart is going to be, and that wobbly wheel, it'll just go away. So I say, I go into the, into the aisle with the bread, and I say, hey, we're going to do that at the end so I don't smash my bread, and I go over and I load it with produce, and I still got a wobbly wheel. And then I say, well, that's okay, and I go over to the meat department, and I, of course, get the plastic wrap, and I put it around my meat because I want the person doing the checkout to be very angry with me and irritated when she does my duty, but regardless, I load the meat in there. And the problem is, is my wheel is still going, uh, uh, right? So then I say, well, I have a solution, Hershey bars. So I go over and I get my Hershey bars and I load them in and I have small children. So I get two or three packs of Hershey bars and in they go. The children will never see them, but that's another sermon for another day. And pretty soon my cart is full and my wheel is just as wobbly as it was at the beginning. My friends, that is what it is like to try to live a life without thankfulness. If you go into your life and you're loading things into your shopping cart, let's say you load some of these things. You load busyness. 
You say, I've got all these things. And you know, I'm not exactly thankful in my life. I don't exactly know what that means. But rather than doing any work on that, I'm just going to not worry about it and notice it. That wobbly wheel will go away over time if I'm just more busy. So I get committed. I get involved. And the involvement and the commitments aren't necessarily bad or good. They're just busy. And I load them into the shopping cart of my life. And er, I got a wheel. Well, then, I've also got some resentments. And those will keep my mind occupied. So I load my resentments of my coworkers and family members and friends from middle school that I had to see at my class reunion that I didn't need to go to, but I did. And I load them all into my shopping cart. And what happens? Er, nothing has been solved. Because the reality is, is that why is the wheel wobbly in our lives when we have a lack of genuine thankfulness? And I'll tell you, you can't get it at the paper store. I tried. So this past week, my dad said, hey, why don't you go get, see if they have any Thanksgiving cards in the paper store? And I said, what are you talking about? What is a Thanksgiving card? Who has ever heard of that? There's a whole aisle. There's a whole aisle. Okay, so you walk over and you look at them. Dear grandson, it's your first Thanksgiving. You won't remember it, but I will. Happy Thanksgiving. What? What? What, are we, what? what is going on? Then I just keep going. And the problem is, is that in our lives, one of the things we can put in that shopping cart is consumerism. Hey, it's not that I'm going to be thankful. It's going to be I'm going to be thankful for. I'm going to be thankful for the car, the house, Etc. And I noticed with that experience in the paper store that it's so easy to think that genuine thankfulness is consumerist thankfulness. It's not. Genuine thankfulness is biblical thankfulness. The Apostle Paul is going to end the book of Colossians with it, and we're literally going to see that he's writing to a group of people. And this is our eighth week of it. And we've gone through weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And it's wonderful. And it's a short letter. And the challenge is, is that just like us today, the Colossian church has times where they have wobbly wheels. They're not thankful about stuff. I wanted to really quickly show you. Look, here's what the text says. Very short text. Chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. And we're going to wait. We're still, yeah. Um, pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should, live wisely among those who are not believers, and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone because thanksgiving makes a difference. Thankfulness makes a difference. And it's inward and it's outward. And you're going to look at that text and say, David, I heard maybe one time anything that sounded exactly thankful. Kind of like when we walk into the paper store and we're shocked when there's all these consumerist thanksgiving cards Thankfulness is not simply I'm thankful for my turkey on Thanksgiving. I am. Every year we go to Raymond's Turkey Farm and we drive two hours without traffic, two and a half hours with mild traffic, and four hours with bad traffic each way to get a turkey. I appreciate that turkey, but that's not what life thankfulness is. Real thankfulness, inward and outward, makes all the difference. Paul's writing to a group of people that are dealing with cultural pressures. He's writing to a group of people that are dealing with a sense of maybe we need to be legalistic. Maybe we need to take on more and feel worse about ourselves because then that'll make us better. And he's writing and he's saying, be thankful, it makes all the difference. And thankfulness, it's inward, outward. You're going to see that we're going to show you the thanksgiving, thankfulness, which makes all the difference. There's a couple of attitudes and actions, and we're about to celebrate thanksgiving. So I want to talk to you today first about thanks praying. So the first thing the Apostle Paul says is he says, hey, we're going to go ahead and devote yourself to prayer. Now, devote yourself. We'll get into that in a moment, but he says devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind 
and a thankful heart. Pray for us too. And we read this before. What the Apostle Paul is showing us here, devote is an idea of continuing something steadfastly. That's what the word says. And, but the problem is, is that doesn't really mean anything. Hey, uh, Jack, go ahead and continue steadfastly. Okay, David, I'll do that. All right. Imagine you're attaching yourself to something. Devote is to attach yourself to something like glue. So imagine I've got small children, so my house is loaded with glue. I have it on the walls. I have it in the cupboard, right? You, you hear me, okay. So imagine you take the glue in your life and you take the person and I'm gonna attach myself to prayer. I'm gonna say, the way I'm gonna devote myself is not continuing steadfastly, whatever that means, but saying, wow, in the morning, I can glue myself to prayer for 30 seconds. At the dinner table, I can glue myself to prayer when I'm struggling with my coworker, I can glue myself to silent mental prayer instead of saying the thing that I really want to say, I might feel better about for nine seconds saying than really bad for nine years later, so I don't, and I glue myself, I attach myself to prayer. Now, it's challenging, but Paul is saying if you glue yourself, attach yourself to prayer, that starts to become part of your identity. Now think about it for a second. The identities that we have, what are the things we attach ourselves to? We attach ourselves to possessions. This Bible is a wonderful Bible. It was given to me by my children when I started my new position. And so if you open it up, it says right here, somewhere, if I can find it, here it goes. Presented to David Cushing by Laura, Ruby, and Henry on the occasion of lead pastor and your 34th birthday, July 27, 2023. And it's got these lovely handprints. How beautiful are those? I've attached myself to this in my life. Sometimes when I preach, I use it. Sometimes when I pray, I use it. It's often on my dinner table. It's often in the office, right? I've attached myself to it. All of us have things we attach ourselves to, like goals, there's not a person my age without a five-year plan. We all have them. Goals, okay? What are other things we attach ourselves to? We attach ourselves to core memories. I told you that for like so many years, my family has been going from here to Methuen to get a turkey, even though there's what down the road? There's bungees down the road. Why do we do it? Because we attach ourselves to a memory, okay? So that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Now, still, it's hard because people say a couple things. They say, hey, I got a wobbly wheel, and it's not helpful. However, however, David, I have all those things in the shopping cart. I have all the busyness right now. You don't understand, David. When am I going to come up with time to pray? When? You tell me when. I've had people say this. You tell me when I can fit Jesus in, and I will do it. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. Okay, it's a busy life. We talk over and over about how the number one felt need of this congregation is people feel so busy. I hear you. So let's show you what Paul says. Here's how Paul says to make it part of your core non-negotiable identity. How do we do it? How do I make prayer part of my non-negotiable idea? Well, there's three things. Number one, we're going to pray with focus. We're going to pray with an alert mind. We have a slide for this. And I want to show you, there's a... Have you ever been either to England and seen a beef eater? It used to be the Queen's Guard, but now it's the, the King's Guard. You remember those guys with the big hats? You're going to say, what does this have to do with prayer? Just you wait. So you go to England or you see a picture of it. And what do they look like? Complete focus, right? When those guys smile, it's international news. I want you to just like think, if your shopping cart is loaded with busyness, okay, fine. However, if you attach yourself to prayer, you can be pushing your busy shopping cart, and anytime you do it, it can be driving to kids' sports activities, it can be waking up in the morning. Just think, hey, right now, if it's for seven minutes, if it's for seven seconds, I'm going to have the focus of the beef eater. I'm just going to pray, and it's just my thing. Maybe I don't have a ton of time, but here we go. So Paul says to do that. He also says, don't just pray with an alert mind, 
because it's not an academic exercise, but also a thankful heart. Now, I like writing thank you notes. Does anybody like writing thank you notes? You know what's really cool about thank you notes? You can't write a novel. Have you ever gotten like a text wall from someone and you're like, too long, didn't read, I don't know what's happening right now. You can't do that in a thank you note. You've got like that much space and you've got about maybe, maybe 30 words you can do. When we pray, we want to do things in a thankful heart, but actually with precision. The Greek word here actually means precision. So what we can say is, okay, I don't need to, when I pray, feel awful that I can't talk about everything. I can just, when I do pray, be precise. Dear God, my daughter had pneumonia this past week. She's feeling a lot better, and the antibiotics are working well. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Pray with a thankful heart precisely. And then one other thing, he says to do it in a connected way. You're going to see that he talks about, and we read it, he talks about praying for him as a Christian who's going out, that he would have faith. Now, in the year 1850, the biggest modernization of human history happened. You can think of the big modernization moments as the internet. Nope, not as big as this. What about cars? Nope, not as big as this. The transatlantic cable. The transatlantic cable meant if you were in New York City or Boston and you wanted to get a message to London, you now didn't need to hand... I'm picking on Jack tonight. I love you, Jack. You didn't need to hand Jack a note, have him get on a boat, have him sail across the ocean, and a month later to get there. And then Jack, because he's a great guy, would be handed another letter. He'd get back on the boat and come back here. And so it would take forever. And it was disconnected, and so there were no decisions in real time. Paul is saying, hey, when you pray, be connected. There are Christians in Venezuela who are going through really difficult stuff. There's Christians in all parts of the world. There's Christians... In other communities, there's Christians in your family. We're connected. If you love Jesus, we're connected. So whenever you pray, make that part of your non-negotiable identity. One of the reasons people say, I can't pray, and we got that wobbly wheel, right? One of the reasons we say, I can't pray, I don't, I don't, no one ever trained me how to pray. Have you ever thought this? Hey, that's fine that the minister gets up and prays, but I'm just an ordinary guy. I don't have, I don't have all that schooling and degrees and that tightness with Jesus. That's not me. Okay, here's what you can do. Be focused, be precise, and if you don't know what else to pray for, there are persecuted Christians around the world, just pray for them. If you started for 30 days pushing your shopping cart and it's wheels wobbly and you just, you don't know what else to do, you say, say, dear God, please be with Christians in Myanmar you're going to find over time that becomes part of your non-negotiable identity. And then what happens? Let's reflect on this. If your wheel is wobbling, you think, is prayer already part of my non-negotiable identity? If it is or isn't, can I just adopt these mindsets? Can I, can I be focused? Can I be precise? And can I be connected? So Paul starts with that. And he doesn't just go with thanks Praying, he also goes to thanks living. Do you notice a little, little play on words? See, it's Thanksgiving week. We're doing thanks praying. Thanks living, he says this. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. So one of the reasons our wheels wobble is we don't live in a monastic community, which means like a, a pulled out place where there's only Christians. So we got a lot of friends with a lot of opinions and a lot of religions or a lot of non-religions. And so we don't always know how to live around them. So sometimes, I'm never speaking to anyone in this room, but sometimes Christians feel the pressure to kind of take Jesus, imagine that he's a sports jersey, put him on a coat hanger and go live our lives. And then we come back and we take the Jesus jersey and we put it on and here we are. Paul is saying, hey, if your wheel is is wobbly, uh, let's go ahead and live wisely among those who are not believers. 
and make the most of opportunities. Not put the Jesus jersey away, but the Greek word here, it's really interesting because it actually, the Greek word for making the most of means to buy back. Now, if you think of it, the Apostle Paul is actually saying, you've got times where you're with Christians and you want to, and we'll get into this, you grow with Christians, but there's times where we're with, we're with non-Christians and there are other values in the world and we don't need to trash the other values, we just don't join in with the other values. And so then when we're with the other values, we want to buy back the time, we want to make the most of, we don't want to get sucked in, we say, wow, I love Jesus, I have his love in my heart, I love the fact that I don't have to just be like everybody else. Also, I have friends who are non-Christians too and co-workers who are non-Christians and family members. I have the opportunity to do life with them too. And so I want to see my time with them as an investment. And that's really what Paul is saying. Hey, invest your time, buy back your time so that if we're living and our wheels wobbling, part of the reason is hey, maybe I'm forgetting that I'm here to be an ambassador for Jesus in all parts of my life, and when I'm with my non-Christian friends or family members, I don't have to get sucked in. I can be super kind, not bang them over the head with the Bible, but have them realize, wow, this person I know is a Christian. This person loves Jesus. Okay, they live a little differently. You're going to see that as we look at this, there's this, whole, there's this whole idea in life, and I love this idea. It says, you show me your friends, and I show you your future. Have you ever heard this phrase? I, I, I use this a lot in the schools when I was teaching. Because when we think of time, we're investing our time. Good investments, if you have teenagers or no teenagers, right? The friends who study are a good investment. The friends who party are a not good investment, and and all of us, we have our growing up, and we, we realize how to navigate this and how to balance it. Now, the challenge is, is when we're like 14, 15, it's, it's pretty clear. But as we get older, it starts to be grayer, and it starts to be more complicated, and we have to say, what does it mean to make the most of my times? Well, I'm going to give you this idea. If you're going to see your Time is an investable resource, and your, your wheel's wobbly. Part of the reason that the wheel wobbles, and we're not thankful, and we're kind of unclear at times, is because we don't know who to grow with and who to invest with. Uh, we want to grow with other Christians. We want to, when you're with the people in this room, and you're struggling with something in your family, in your marriage, in your finances. These are people we grow with. It's not that these are all the experts because we're not all the experts, but we have access to resources and we can start talking and strategizing and praying about it, right? We're going to attach ourselves to prayer. And then when we're with non-Christians, there are certain conversations that are great. If I need to figure out what stock to buy, great to talk to a non-Christian about. If I'm having trouble with my prayer life, not great to talk to a non-Christian about. Instead, what I look at is I say, hey, when I'm with Christians, we can grow together. When I'm with non-Christians, those are investable opportunities. Maybe there's kind of things that they can help me with, but overall, I have the opportunity to minister them, to just be kind and to show them Jesus through my words, thoughts, and my deeds. Now, here's the thing. When I was in eighth grade, because it all comes back to middle school, right? If you ever got a wobbly wheel, it all comes back to middle school. We get a middle school mentality. When I was in eighth grade, I had a friend who was not a Christian, and he failed his math test. True story. His name was Connor. This was so long ago that it won't matter. And we're not friends on Facebook. Now, Connor asked me to destroy his math test, okay? I'm not kidding. And I said yes. So I destroyed his math test for him, and now... The math test that he failed had disappeared. Now, the problem is, is like, I forgot about this for a couple of days. But then his mom, who was an elementary school teacher at my school, because my school was a K-12 school, was really angry about him destroying his math test. 
and it got back to me. And he threw me under the bus. And I was like, wait, what's... Because here's the challenge. When I was in eighth grade, I had a clear sense that I was a Christian who loved Jesus. And I had a clear sense because I came to church, I prayed, I read my Bible. I was 13, so again, I'm 34 now. I'm not going to say it's identical, but I had enough of a sense of right and wrong, and I had a Christian family. And it was really clear that with Christians I needed to grow and non-Christians I needed to invest. And what I learned that day is when I just imitate what everybody else is doing, when my friend says, hey, destroy my math test for me, and I do, because that's a, that's a great analogy for some of, the, some of the boneheaded decisions we all make, right? We, it's a simple, harmless thing where we go with something and then it burns us. Because as Christians, we want to grow with other Christians and invest with everybody else, not destroy their math test for them and be the scapegoat when they blame us to their mom. So I want to reflect on this, and I have a couple questions. So here's, here's the questions I'll ask. Who are the Christians in your life who help you grow? We give you a sheet every week. You're going to notice there's a devotional guide. It's got sermon, then it's got big idea and points, then it's got space for sermon notes on the back. Sometimes people miss it. I think we actually, we had a printing error, so it's two sheets, so you have tons of room for notes for this service only. You notice on that other sheet, there's questions to help you with the text. And then there's an activity at the bottom. And the activity bot at the bottom asks you, starting whenever you were, came to know Jesus, became a Christian, at that point, who were the Christians who helped you grow? And who were the non-believers who you could start to invest in? And then the activity asks you to be really honest. Like, are, take through your four moments in your life, seasons. Which seasons have you done it better than others? Because we all have that season where the numbers of Christians who help us grow is small. And the number of non-believers that we're maybe letting influence us maybe is a little inordinate. And then... It asks you to just kind of reflect and balance on, and say, was there a balance? Because here's our question. Who are the Christians who helped me grow today? Who are the non-believers who I can invest in so I can live missionally? Because if I'm having a hard time with living, with thanks living, my wheel is wobbling. One of the reasons is I maybe have the wrong balance. Am I being careful to make that distinction? Because when my wheel's wobbling, I can start to get off base. And that's why we want to say, hey, Thanksgiving is coming up. Yeah, I'm going to celebrate Thanksgiving. But how is my thanks praying going? How is my thanks living going? And finally, it all comes back to what are words. What about thanks speaking? So the Apostle Paul ends with this. And it's really important because I don't know about you, but I'm coming into the understanding that we live in a bite-sized society where we can almost like bumper sticker people, right? If, if people say something, we can like remember them forever by like five words. We can. Think about it. Maybe it's just me. I don't think so. We can have these moments where someone will say something and that's all that we remember about them. And now for the rest of eternity, we got this like bumper sticker phrase. The problem is, is that people can do that to us and the Apostle Paul warns the church of Colossae. He says, hey, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you'll have the right response for everyone. Don't get yourself into trouble with your words, but gracious and attractive. Let's look at what those, those are. So gracious comes from the Greek word charis. It literally means the outworking of God's will. And you're going to say, what does that mean? Okay, all right. Gracious means the words I have. Grace, one of the ways we understand grace is the cross. Jesus came for us, died on the cross. We didn't deserve it. So that's God's will in a positive way. We don't deserve it for us. Okay, so in our words, are our words in line with the characteristics of God, in his values? Are our characteristics, are, are our words 
merciful and kind and loving, gracious. But then there's another thing, too. It's also attractive. And it's interesting. Some, some translations say seasoned with salt. Attractive literally means to be flavored by Christ's influence. Have you ever heard someone who said, oh, I, I speak like a sailor? Okay, that means they're, they're flavored like a sailor, right? So when we think of our words, is my, do I speak like a sailor? Do I speak like a this? Or is my speech flavored by Christ's influence? Do I speak like Jesus, right? That's what the Apostle Paul is trying to say. I don't need to give you some big story or example here. We all have times where we've said things that have destroyed relationships that were avoidable. We've all had times that things have been said to us that have destroyed relationships that were avoidable. As we're entering the season with the Thanksgiving dinner table, with the Christmas parties, with the New Year's celebration, I don't need to tell you that as Christians, we have a great opportunity to speak different, to have thanks speaking in our lives, to have gracious speaking that literally, it's just in line with God's will, with with the characteristics of God, that we say, wow, I don't need to be all over the place. I can speak graciously and in an attractive way. I have to be influenced by something. Being flavored by Christ in my words doesn't mean I talk like I'm the King James Bible. It means that I realize that I have a personal relationship with Jesus and that he's influenced the way I speak. So I have a couple questions, and I really want us to think about this. Does my speech reflect God's character? Does it? Does my speech reflect God's character? I'm not going to sell you on that. Just prayerfully consider that this week. Great time to do this. Is my speech transformed by my relationship with Jesus? Because if my wheel is wobbling, sometimes it's a speaking problem. Sometimes the reason I'm not thankful is because all my words are getting in the way. What we have the opportunity is to say, hey, my speech can be reflecting God's character. He's kind, honest. Let's even stick with those. He's kind and honest, right? How different would that be? If I just simply said, for the next couple weeks, I'm going to be kind and honest in my speech. And my speech, I'm not going to speak like a sailor. I'm going to speak like Jesus. I'm going to, you know what Jesus did a lot of? How can I help you? That's what he did a lot of. What can I do for you? He did a lot of listening. Our speech gracious and attractive. You want gracious and attractive speech. One of the ways we can do that this week is maybe by letting our speech be less and lead to listening. Because ultimately, if we are dealing with a wobbly wheel, we joked about that. You got your shopping cart. It's loaded with all sorts of things. It's loaded with busyness and resentment and all sorts of things. If you're dealing with the wobbly wheel, thankfulness makes all the difference. We can do it through praying, attaching and devoting ourselves to prayer. We can do it with our living. We can do it with our speaking. And so that's what we're invited to. It's Thanksgiving. It makes sense. It's a great time. If you are struggling with this, we've just got the opportunity to say, hey, I don't need to continue having a wobbly wheel. I can surrender to God. I can acknowledge that sometimes I get out of alignment A lot of the times I get out of alignment, and therefore, what's going to make a difference? Thankfulness. Not thankfulness for something that was given to me for a possession, but saying, wow, I can live a life of thankfulness. I can pray, I can have actions, and I can speak, and it'll make the difference. Let's pray. Father God, we're so grateful for the way you work in our lives. Lord, as we enter into this season of so many holidays, beginning with Thanksgiving. Lord, would you let us be people who are thankful, people who inwardly and outwardly are thankful. The times where we struggle, maybe we simply need to attach ourselves to prayer a little more. Lord, would you give us the willingness to do that? At the times where we get off base in other ways, Lord, would you send Christians into our lives to encourage us, to remind us, that we can be more like Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
We're going to sing a, a final song. Um, because I'm not quite as good as Elizabeth, we're not going to be singing uh, Now Thank We All, a God. We're going to sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Fits really well. Hymn number 116. Let's sing loud and proud. 116. Father, through his grace and through his love, send us forth with peace this week to have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide in our hearts today and forevermore. Amen.